All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. We are going through the book of Romans. Uh, Brother Steve, thank you for another good praise and worship service. Uh, we have a great uh, worship team, and we praise God for all of them. Today I want to talk to you about God's sovereignty over Israel. God's sovereignty over Israel. And if you remember, uh, we finished eight chapter 8 last week, and it was just a high a crescendo. It was just a, a great time. And, you know, uh, the security of the believer was the last verse. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And it almost seems like at this time, uh, there's a pause. in chapter uh, 9 and 10 and 11 are really different uh, than Paul's writing up to that point. And we'll share some of that with you in just a second. But let me give you the outline if you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us. A uh, real simple outline. Number one, Paul's burden. Paul had a huge burden. Okay, a burden. Number two, Abraham's seed. Abraham's seed. It talks about the history of Israel. How Israel came into being and God, them being God's chosen people. And number three, God's mercy. Folks, we've all seen God's mercy and God's grace in our life. If you are saved, you have experienced the grace and the mercy of God. And you need to thank God every day for your salvation. Folks, he did not have to choose you. I'm telling you, that's what the sovereignty of God means. God does everything for a reason and a purpose. God is in control of everything. He doesn't check in with us. Even though we leave, live in a me world, it's me, me, me. But I got news for you. At the end of your life, you will thank God that he chose you because we get to spend all of eternity with Christ and Jesus and God in heaven. So uh, turn. you've already turned to Romans 9, but let me give you my introduction. Paul continually clashed with Judaism and Jewish leaders of his days. One of their arguments was if the gospel of Jesus Christ was accepted by the Gentiles, God would be forsaking the Jewish people. The Bible clearly says that both Jews and Gentiles must be saved by grace and faith in Jesus Christ. Jews and Gentiles must turn from trusting in their own religious achievements, humble themselves, turn from their sin, and accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah and Lord. In Romans 9, Paul shows that the nation of Israel was judged because of their unbelief and their rejection of Jesus Christ as the true Son of God. Paul's point is that the nation as a whole will reject the gospel, but a remnant of Israel will eventually come to Jesus by faith, especially in the last days. Let's look at this amazing scripture Paul penned by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And again, Romans 9, 10, and 11 are written to the nation of Israel as a whole. And, it, and we can make application to the Christian life, but he is talking about the nation of Israel. Romans 9, verse 1, I tell you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing witness of the Holy Spirit. And Paul is uh, just letting the writers know that he is serious about what he's fixing to say, that he is serious about his beliefs, that he loved the Jewish brethren, that he had a burden for the Jewish brethren. And folks, there's a difference between being bothered by something and having a burden for something. When you are bothered, it just comes and goes. All right, It's kind of like a commercial you see on TV, and if it bothers you, you just change the channel. But when you have a burden, it's something that you live with. It is something that you wake up with. It is something that you go to sleep with. It's something that is always in your prayers. So Paul had this huge burden, huge burden from the Holy Spirit, says verse 1, that I have great sorrow and continued grief in my heart. His heart was broken, folks. It was broken. Why? Because his fellow kinsmen, the Jewish people, totally rejected who he was and what he was about. He was an enemy of them to many of the Jewish people. 
They thought he had sold them out because of who he was before he came to Christ. And this huge burden in his life uh, was that his brethren and his kinsmen would be saved. Folks, we all have family that needs Jesus Christ. We all have friends that need Jesus Christ. And our hearts need to be broken over these folks. And we need to be praying for these people. And that's what Paul is trying to say here. Look at verse 3. For I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. He is saying, I would go to hell if they would be saved. Now folks, we know that's impossible. God's not going to answer that prayer because he's a just God. He's a fair God. But Paul was just trying to demonstrate to the people, trying to share his heart with his countrymen. Man, I love you guys. God loves you guys. And you don't get it. Jesus Christ came. Jesus Christ lived. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And you are not recognizing Him as the Messiah. And folks, the same is truth uh, here today. The same is truth in our world today. There are literally thousands, if not millions of people that reject Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And that's the burden that Paul was sharing. He was just saying, if I could take their place, I would. Now folks, that is a burden. Then, starting in verse 4, he tells the seven blessings God gave the nation of Israel. He's saying, listen, God gave you these things. If you look at your heritage, if you look at the Old Testament, if you look at history, you can see what's going on here. Look what he says in verse 4. Who are Israelites? And we know the Israelites were God's chosen people. God personally chose them. When, when Abram was born and when, when that was going on, and we'll speak of that in a minute, he could have chosen any nation. But I have news for you folks. We as the United States better stand with Israel. We better stand with them. Because I'm telling you, God's got His hand on them and He is protecting them. And he, they are God's chosen people. The second thing, not only Israelites, to who pertain adoption. You are God's children. Not because you were born an Israelite. Okay, And that was part of the problem with the Jews. They thought because they were God's chosen people, they had God's favor, and God was going to save them whether they believed in Jesus Christ or not. But in, the, the thing you have to realize is, Israel is God's chosen nation, but Christians are God's chosen people. And there are saved Jews. I'm not saying they're all lost. I'm not even trying to say that. I'm just saying Paul is trying to get them to understand what God has already done for them. And we can see these things happening in the Old Testament. We are God's children because we were adopted, and they were adopted. And then it says the glory What's the glory? That's God's presence. It was in a cloud by day and it was in a fire by night. It was in the Holy of Holies where God was. And now it is the Holy Spirit. God's presence is everywhere. Folks, I sense and feel God's presence every Sunday in our church. He is here. So they saw the glory of God. The covenants, which began with, a began with Abraham. The covenants. And the giving of the law, that's the Ten Commandments and the Word of God and the service of God. That was the Levites and the temple priests, all these things in the Old Testament and the promise. And there were promises is the word there, but the greatest promise he gave uh, the children of Israel was that a Messiah is coming. Jesus is coming. Folks, Jesus has come. And these are the seven blessings he's talking about. Of whom are the fathers from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. I got news for you folks. God's in control. God's running this deal. I don't care who's in Washington, D.C. I don't care who the, the Senate and the, 
and all that is, I'm telling you, God is in control. His sovereignty is, is, is yes and is amen. He knows what he's doing. Doesn't matter what everybody else is doing, folks. As a Christian, I'm just going to trust God and believe God. Matter of fact, Paul says in Romans 10, look at Romans 10, talking about Paul's burden. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Folks, salvation is so important. Salvation means where you'll spend eternity. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our salvation. And it says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Folks, a zeal means, you know, you, that they're fired up about this. A zeal means, uh, it, even when you hear the word zealot, okay, you're talking about somebody that, man, I'm, I'm telling you, we're, we're going after it. We're, we're going to be aggressive in that. And folks, the problem with that is you may have a zeal for the wrong thing. And folks, we need to follow God. We need to follow God's Word. That's the zeal that we need to have. They were more concerned about the law. They were more concerned about the robes they had on. They were more concerned about their appearance in public. They were more concerned about all these things than God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. They thought their works were a gift to God. They thought, some of them thought they were a gift to God. And folks, I am telling you, it's not our own righteousness. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament, the best we have to give to God is like filthy rags. We are sinners. We sin. You sin this week. I sin this week. We are sinners, and we need God's righteousness. We need His mercy, and we need His grace and His in our lives. So Paul had this huge burden for his countrymen. So now back in our text, look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. The Abra Abraham's seed. Romans 9 verse 6. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are all not, is not all Israel who are Israel, nor are they children because they are the seed of Abraham. There's some things that you need to understand. One is there's a physical seed. Okay, that's what the Israelites were. They were God's chosen people. But there's also a spiritual seed. Those are children of God. And there is a difference in those two. Matter of fact, as you look down through here, it's so important that you realize what he is talking about with with Abraham. Hold your finger there and go to Genesis chapter 12 with me. Genesis 12, verse 1. This is a promise to Abram. Abraham's name was changed later on, but this is a promise to Abram. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I want to show you. I will make you a great nation. And God has done that. I will bless you. God has done that. I will make your name great. God has done that. And you shall be a blessing. God has done that. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That was a promise. That was a covenant relationship between God and Israel. And folks, you have to understand this. To understand uh, verses... Uh, verses 6 through verse 13, you have to understand what this seed was and what this seed was about. And we know that God later on promised Abraham and Sarah that they would have a son. And she was barren. And we knew it would take an act of God to do that. And while they were waiting, Sarah got impatient with God and said, I'm never going to have a child. So what did she do? She let her uh, ser her servant, uh, Hagar, have relations with Abraham, and we know Ishmael came out of that. And folks, 
that that whole thing there was wrong because they would not wait on God. And we were talking now about the Edomites. And now we're talking about even years later, the Edomites were a thorn in Israel's flesh. And now, ever since then, to this day, the Arabs, the Arabs, those there, they are of that lineage. So you can see how one mistake a person makes can, can alter a lot of things. And the other thing you have to understand before we go on is Ishmael was the firstborn. And the firstborn had all the rights. They were heirs. They got twice the blessing and all these things going on. And, and we know uh, later on that Sarah had Isaac. And Isaac uh, was a blessing from God. A blessing from God. And then Isaac had children. And they had Jacob and Esau. They were twins. And we know that Esau was a firstborn. And you say, what's this got to do with the sovereignty of God? Folks, God chose, even before they were born, the birthright should have went to Ishmael and to Esau, but it didn't. Why? Because God chose another way. And folks, God doesn't have to have our permission. He's God, and He knows what's going on. And all, everything changed when it came to these things. There was that separation of the Jews and the Gentiles. And it's God's election. It is the election that is the rest of the story. Now let's, let's look back at our text and apply that to this. But it is not that the Word of God has no effect. What he's saying is God did make a mistake, folks. God knows what he's doing. For they are not all Israel who are Israel. Okay? Even being God's chosen people, I'm telling you, there are saved Israelites and there's non-saved Israelites. Nor are they all children because of the seed of Abraham. I explained that. But in Isaac, your seed shall be called. And folks, we know Isaac later on had kids. And remember what they were? They were the 12 tribes. Of, it had Jacob. And Jacob had uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. So it was a plan of God all along. Folks, there's a lot of things in life I don't understand. And when it comes to predestination and election, if you think of it too long, it's going to drive you crazy. If you dwell on it, why? Because God can do anything God wants to do. And even in predestination, I'll, I'll explain this in just a second. Look at verse 8. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as the seed. And folks, that promise was Jesus Christ, our Lord. You can be born in Israel, you can be a Jew all your life, but you come to Christ the same way everybody else does. You have to acknowledge Jesus Christ is the Messiah and the Son of God. Then you become the spiritual seed of Abraham. That's what he's trying to say. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And we know that son was Isaac. And not only this, but when Rebekah, that, that is Isaac's wife, also conceived by one man, even our father Isaac, for the children not being born yet, nor having done any evil or good, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. And folks, when it comes to election, I'm telling you, it's God. It is God. God is the one that decides. God is one that elects. But I'm telling you what a lot of people's mistakes are. They leave out the free will of man. Now, how do you explain this? Here's the way I, I explain it. It's not an easy thing to grasp in your mind. But the bottom line is God can choose any one he wants, but it's not a random choice. He didn't, before time began, and say, you're going to be saved, you're going to be saved, you're going to be lost, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to be saved. I don't believe that, folks. And that is how some people believe. God, in his foreknowledge, knew beforehand what these people 
we're going to do. You go back to Cain and Abel. What did Abel? He gave an offering and God accepted it. He didn't accept Cain's. Why? I think there's two reasons. Because of a lack of faith and his stinking attitude. And what did Cain end up doing? He killed his brother. You go all the way forward to Judas. How can a man live around, Judas, live around Jesus his whole life and not be saved? It was in Judas's heart. Judas made that decision. Okay, he made that decision. And you can look all through history, folks, and, and that is a form of, of what we are talking about. God knew beforehand what we were going to do. And it says, And it was said to her, The older shall, uh, shall serve the younger, as is written. And so we can see that God chose, God chose, uh, uh, excuse me, Isaac over Ishmael, and he chose uh, Jacob over, help me out here. Yay, you're with me. <laughs> Ephesians 1. Go with me to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Folks, we are a blessed people. We are a blessed people. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Folks, he chose us. That's what predestination is. I heard a preacher in Lawton, Oklahoma. It, actually, he was evangelist. And here's his words. He said, if God decides to save you, you have no say in it whatsoever. And here's the next word he said. And I was a young youth minister, and I thought, that ain't right. He said, you'll come down the aisle kicking and screaming if God has to do that. Now, folks, I can't agree with that. It would be, if I'm kicking and screaming, I don't want to go. And folks, I'm telling you, God, in his foreknowledge, predestined those he knew that was his. What do we do with Romans chapter 10? Verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. It didn't say might be saved. What do we do with that verse? And so we see what he is saying here. Have predestined us as adoptions as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. It's God's will. It's his will. And we also know that the Bible says he doesn't want anyone to perish. But that doesn't mean everyone's saved. Everyone has to decide for themselves. Am I accepting? Am I asking forgiveness of my sin? Do I truly want Jesus to come into my life and be Lord of my life? Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Oh folks, God's election is real. God's election is fair. God's election is just. And we our will, we as men, we have to say yes or no to Jesus Christ. So we see Paul's burden. We see Adam's seed. And again, when we're talking about seed, we're talking about the, you know, the Israelites as a nation. But also, it applies to the church today. We're talking about the spiritual seed of Abraham. Now we see not only Paul's burden and Abraham's seed, look at God's mercy. Look back in our text. Look at God's mercy. God's mercy. Verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Look what Paul said. Certainly not. You know what he's saying? Unbelievable. I can't even believe you think that. Certainly not. Exclamation point. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Folks, that's God's choice. You don't mess with God. You don't tell what God, you don't tell God what to do. I got news for you. He could slap you today. All right. You don't mess with God. You you just don't. I heard the story one time of a guy. He was out on a ship. And I don't know all that went on, but this is a true story. 
I know it is because it was in Reader's Digest. <laughs> I'm not sure where I read it. But he was out there, and he, he was telling his buddy, well, I don't believe in God. And he said, you know, and the guy said, hey, take it easy, buddy. You don't need to be saying that. There's some clouds coming up. There's a storm coming up. He said, well, I don't believe in God. I don't, I don't believe he's there. And he said, you just need to chill out now. God can do anything. And he got on the bow of the ship and just raised his fist. If you are God, you strike me with lightning. I'm just telling you what I read. I don't know if it's a fact or not. But I got news for you folks. God can do that. But God doesn't want to do that. God wants you to come in love. God wants you to come because the Holy Spirit is telling you to come. God wants you to come because He knows eternity is forever and ever and ever. So folks, I'm telling you, it's God's mercy. I look at my own life. I look at my, my life when I was 19 and 20 years old. And folks, I was raised in church, but I ran for God. I didn't go to church for two years. My parents were heartbroken. And God would have been just to not call me to salvation. Because I was a sinner and I knew I was. I knew even though I'd been baptized, if I died, I was going straight to hell. I knew that. But God, in His mercy, gave me another chance. Folks, I'm telling you, if God has given you a chance today, I would say when the invitation starts, you just come down this aisle and we will help you. The Bible says in verse 16, So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. How many of the Old Testament prophets ran from God? What about Jonah? <laughs> he thought he could get down the bottom of a ship and sleep it off and go to some other way. What did God do? <laughs> he sent a fish. Can you imagine being in a fish for three days and three nights? Bait stinks. Can you imagine that? Dead stuff and you're floating around in there. The whale throws him back up on land. He thought, you know what? I think I'll go to Nineveh today. <laughs> what was that? It was God's mercy, folks. It, it was God's grace. And He saved you by faith because of His mercy and His grace. For the Scripture says, verse 17, to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may declare, be declared from all the earth. Therefore He has mercy on whom He wills, and whom He wills He hardens. And folks, we know the story of Moses and Pharaoh. We know... Uh, Moses was raised by Egyptian uh, queen. We know that he had the finest learning. He had the very same upbringing as Pharaoh. One was saved and born again. One hardened his heart. See, I believe God gives everybody a chance. Everybody. Everybody has a chance to be saved. And the difference is some just reject Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. So folks, it's not up to us. It's up to God. God gives people uh, many, many chances. His sovereignty is true. And I'm just telling you, today, if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I mean, I'm just telling you, He wants you saved. He does. Folks, the Bible is true. The history of Israel is true. Every word, Old Testament, the law is true. It still applies for us today. The New Testament is, is basically Jesus saves. And Paul is pouring his heart out to these folks. Preaching the Word of God, saying, and notice he goes down through Israel's history. He hits them right where they are and tries to tell them how wrong they are. And let me tell you something. I've said this many a time in our church. Everyone, everywhere needs Jesus Christ. Folks, I'm telling you, it's real. 
I'm not trying to be a doomsday, but we're living in the last days. Go to Matthew 24 and read the whole chapter, and you tell me one thing that hasn't already taken place on this earth. Time is short, and I'm telling you, if you sit here a believer in Jesus Christ, you ought to thank your holy God that He has chosen you, that He loves you, that no matter what situation you're in, He's there for you. There's nothing too hard for God. Nothing too hard. In the last Scripture, back in Ephesians 1, and I close with this, Ephesians 1, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood. Folks, I'm telling you, Jesus was born of a virgin. He, Joseph could not be his biological father or Jesus would have sinned just like you and I. But he was perfect. God took the Holy Spirit and placed the Holy Spirit in Jesus in Mary. He lived 33 years of perfect life. He was crucified by the Romans. But who put the Romans up to it? Folks, I'm telling you, it was the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders. He died on a cross. But three days later, he arose, showing victory over death. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God as we speak. And then I'm telling you, folks, there's going to be an invitation somewhere on earth. Somebody is going to come down and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and only God knows. The Bible says even Jesus doesn't know this. Read Matthew, but God will look over at Jesus. He'll point to him and say, go get your bride. Folks, today could be the day. Today could be the day. And we have to face the righteous God in all of eternity. His blood, forgiveness, according to the riches of His grace, which He abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. Folks, He's so wise. Our wisest men are dumb compared to Jesus. Sometimes these intellectuals, I'm telling you, they're so smart. They're, they're just, I'm just like, dude, you don't get it. You need a good dose of Jesus is what you need. Your brain power ain't getting you in, folks. You're not talking your way in. You're not debating your way in. Whether you believe it or not, Jesus is coming. Having made known to us the mystery of His will. There's a lot of things mystery. There's a lot of things I understand. I teach predestination, and I'm still not sure I understand it. But I don't have to, folks. Jesus takes care of it. For His good will, in His good pleasure, He purposed Himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, He may gather together one all things in Christ, both who are in heaven and who are on earth and who are in Him. Every time somebody gets saved, He's gathering His people together. Gathering His people together. Folks, you think that, I think our worship service is awesome. I think our music is awesome. I think when we worship up here, it is awesome. But I'm telling you, it's not going to be like heaven as much as we think. And I love I love what God is doing here. But when we all get up there and literally millions of people praising God and worshiping God and adoring God and singing to God, oh, folks, you've never heard anything like this in your life. Bottom line on predestination, God knows and you still have a chance. God is working with you. God gives you a free will. And I pray today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you will come today. Folks, I've said here I'm 64 years old, and I will say this till the day I die. The day I got saved was the greatest day of my life. Because my name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life in God. I'm, I'm just telling you, you can't erase that. The devil can't have it. And we will live for him forever and ever and ever. And the last thing, Christian, there's folks that you need to tell. Folks, you need to tell them. Not some, somebody else. 
you need to tell these folks about Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for the day. and God, I pray that we understand. And God, I know uh, election and predestination can be confusing. But God, all I know is you are God and we are not. And God, I just today thank you that you have chosen us. And God, I just pray, Lord, that uh, we would be sharing the gospel with people around us. And God, I pray that we would, God, just uh, really look at our own lives. And God, I pray that if there's just one here that doesn't know you, today would be their day of salvation. Lord, if there's Christians here that need to just come to the prayer altar and pray for a lost family member, or pray for a lost friend, or pray for a lost work associate. God, I pray that that would begin right here in this place. Others may need to rededicate their life to Christ or even come for baptism. Baptism is just not being ashamed. Baptism is just what Jesus did. He went into the Jordan River and was baptized. And we need to be like Jesus. So God, I pray if others want to join our church and they're saved and they've been scripturally baptized, God, I pray you speak to them. God, this is your invitation. This is your time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Bedvis Church. And may God richly bless you.